John, last week you brought up this category of transitions and how in the middle of last summer, God kind of revealed to you how necessary it is for soul to make these transitions, not just jump into the next thing. It's, and it's a way of kind of arresting the world and living soulfully. When you shared that, honestly, I went, first of all, that's radical. Like people just don't do it. The world's demands to jump into the next thing. The atmosphere is so strong that it's rarely done. And you gave a few examples, but what I am curious about is that was last summer and we're now into the next year and you're talking about it and how God spoke and it was something he matured you in and you engaged in it enough that it's shaped who you are now, but you jumped into your world. You were back in the throes of it. I, I, I'd love to hear from you regarding like, what's the practical, how do you do that? How do you take a treasure that God's bringing that's frontier for you and actually live into it in a way that it really does have staying power? Yeah, that's huge. So friends, welcome back to the second part of a conversation. If you didn't hear, first installment. You might want to go back and pick that up, but we're talking about hanging on to lessons that God has given us from the past and just how incredibly contrary that is to the next thing, the next thing, the next thing culture that we live in. So it's really interesting. The things that God does, the fruit of it is so enjoyable that you want that path. I mean, Peter to Jesus, we're where are we going to go? You have the words of life. Like the fruit of transition is so wonderful that I want it. I, I'm like, yes, God, show me more, teach me more. Now, perfect application? No. Stumbling through the fall? Absolutely. The actual story of the book is it's taking me this long. I'm literally finishing the book now which is a much kinder rhythm than to try and, you know, do it in seven months, mm -hmm. not three months. And that's transition, you know, but even yesterday, it's just cracking up. So I, I've been at the computer for a lot of my day trying to get this manuscript done. And the disruption in my life is, is this little female golden retriever we have, who's, you know, two and a half years old and she's just full of energy. And so she comes in on a regular basis and drops the ball in my lap and she's like, <laughs> let's play. What are That's you doing? Great. You know, well, here was the choice. It was, I knew that she needed to go for a walk. I knew I needed to go for a walk. Now here, here's a really interesting thing. I, some time ago, I told myself, John, you know that you need a walk every day. I don't run anymore. It was hard on my knees. I walk. And I know that. I know that. I need to walk every day. I am a better human being. I find God. I can pray. All that. I'm talking 20 minutes. This isn't, you know, I'm going to go wander in the woods for, you know, three hours and commune with nature. I'm talking 20 minutes. Yes. Usually at the end of the day, right? And it was 20 outside. It was slightly snowing. Everything in me said, no way, man. I'm just going to stay here and work. It's just easier. And, and then there's that little voice that says, really, that's a super bad choice. And, and so I got up, pulled on some layers, took the dog, went out in the woods for 20 minutes. That's all it was. It was this massive rescue. Pulled me out of screen time, pulled me out of technology, pulled me out of the ether world that, that, that sitting in front of computers does to you. And, and thanks to my dog insisting on it. So have I done it perfectly? No. Am I doing it more and more? Absolutely. And, and looking for those transitions now, looking for them. You know, like for me, the day after Christmas, it just blows me away. I understand people have different rhythms, different vibes, but day after Christmas, people literally pack up Christmas and box it up, get the tree out of the house, we're done. Get the, we're done. Well, now we're back. Life is normal again. Go, 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 go. And I'm like, are you kidding me? The days between Christmas and New Year's are some of my favorite days of the year because they tend to be pretty quiet. Yes. Right? My inbox is not raging. My phone is not ringing that much. And, and so I love those days. Don't touch it. 
don't, if you don't have to hurl yourself back in, why in heaven's name would you? You know, so looking for those transitions. Yeah. Now, the larger subject here, uh, friends, if you're catching up on the conversation, is actually not about transitions, helpful as that is. We're talking about hanging on to things God has said, things he's shown you, lessons like look back on your 2018, listening friends, look back on your 2018 and go, oh man, there were some huge things that God was dealing with or showing me or inviting me into and hang on to it, like stay there, go with it. The spiritual calendar is very different than the Gregorian calendar and, uh, you know, the point is, God, where are we still working and what were you building on? So can you tell another story? Was there something else from 2018 that you would look back on and go, oh, that was super helpful? Yeah. the Another piece and a theme from 2018, it was huge. Um, it came out of a passage that God took me back into last spring. And, uh, and you know, it's interesting with the scriptures, John. Okay. I just love this conversation because pause. Does anyone remember the verse that they were in <laughs> in the spring of 2018? Hey, it's only because I'm a disaster and I can't get past it. That's no, the only reason. this is reason. it. This is the gold. <clears throat> well, I was um, stuck. I was stuck. And I, was, and I just know that in him is life. And his life is the light of the hearts of men. And yet, here I am going, I'm banging my head against the same door. And... He took me into a scripture and, and, and it's funny. I even pause before I read this because we get so familiar with these passages. I even find my heart going, oh, I know that passage or, oh, I know that story or I know where he's going to go. And I find the same thing, but th- they are, they are limitless in what God's bringing and particular to the season that we're in. Right. There's always a fresh piece and portion. And so he took me into the story of the plank and the speck where Jesus is speaking to his disciples and he says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your eye? And it's just preposterous of just the proportion there. So Jesus is saying, here's the deal. In this situation where you feel very justified and valid in your frustration, in your anger about this person's issue, let me just start the conversation with you have a plank of wood in your eye and this person has a speck. And just right there, you go, wait a second. That's not what I'm saying, Jesus. And then he says, how, how can you say to your friend, let me take the speck out of your eye when there's a plank in your eye? He says, first, you must take the plank out of your own eye. And this is the part I so appreciate that came last year is, so that you can see clearly to remove the speck from your friend's eye. And John, where, where the father took me was we all are prone to not seeing clearly inherent in the gap between who we are and becoming perfectly whole and in union with God. We do not see clearly. We do not. Uh, and, and we have a bend in our sin nature to uh, self-deception and in humility, it's actually really helpful to simply name in any situation like marriage, for example, whatever is going on here, it's very fair and reasonable and even loving to tell my soul, I am not seeing clearly. Now, don't not to make an agreement with, um, I can't see but to say whatever else is operating in the situation, part of what's going on is something in me. And Jesus seems to be pretty adamant to say, start with as a percentage, as a priority, it's far more significant than what's happening in the other person. Okay. So he gave that to you in the spring. Yep. And then what? And so then. Like, why? Why was that? <laughs> what was that teeing you up for? What it surfaced was a strong undercurrent of energy in my life that really came into this belief of if I could just change this thing, change this thing in my finances, change this thing in my body, 
change this thing in my marriage, then I will be well. Then I will be at peace. Then finally, fill in the blank. Instead, rather than if I want to be mature, and as you said, I want the fruit of it. If I want peace, I know that it has to begin with an honest care and consideration of, God, what are you surfacing in me? What of my brokenness and what of my not yet is adding to my inability to love in this situation? And what I found was circumstances didn't change. Those externals in other people and places and positions, those didn't change. But as I got more honest in this belief that Jesus is most concerned with what my part of it is, I found that I saw differently. I found Mm. that it was allowing Mm. me to bless and not Mm. curse, to have Mm. compassion. And John, the other piece is to hear from God. It, it, It started cultivating a deeper capacity to say, God, you have my attention with what you want to do in this situation. And, and, and the passage is brilliant because it's so that we might love. The whole goal is to love that person and help them with their spec. In other words, Jesus doesn't disregard that. He's not saying that the only thing at work is what's in you. Not at all. He's saying, if you want to love that person, hmm. the path to get there is contending with your inner world. And then even when he says the measure you give will be measured into you, as I begin to have compassion for myself, I'll have compassion for them. Mm -hmm. As I, you know, love Mm -hmm. begets love, forgiveness begets forgiveness. So what I found was God was upping the stakes. As we talked last week, there is a progression and a promotions in the kingdom and the, the risks get bigger, the stakes get bigger. And God took me, as I look back now from last spring, it's interesting, I think through summer and then fall and then winter, he put me in situations that the stakes were bigger, that the hurt was larger in me from other things. And instead, I had practiced this fundamental reality of the kingdom mm. and it, it really rescued some situations mm. that could have mm. went sideways. Mm. You know, there's a longing that's actually surfacing in me as you're telling that story. And it has nothing to do with that story. It has to do with, oh my goodness, what are the things that God showed me last year that he knew I would need for this year? Mm. And I didn't, I didn't connect that. Like there's a progression, there's a building. He, you know, his lessons are not buffet. They're not random. It's not lottery. It's not even pick and choose. Yes. You know, one of the things is if you refuse to learn the lesson, he just has to bring it up next time. Yes. Right? And he'll just bring it up again. And he'll keep bringing it up for 20 years, you know, until we until we go with the lesson. So the longing, Morgan, that's surfacing here, he showed you this beautiful thing. Yes. That began to shape your most important relationships. Yes. And the longing in me is, oh my gosh, I want to go back and remember things that God has been showing me, knowing that he knows my future, I must need them. Yes. So here's another one for me. This one is also located in last summer. I had a couple of very specific hopes for last summer. And, and there was a particular river I wanted to fish that I was really looking forward to. And, and you know that one of our shared joys is finding shed elk antlers the elk drop their antlers every year and they're gorgeous and beautiful. And, you know, if you can find them in the woods, they're just so fun and they're little treasures. And I, there was a place I knew that if I could get to, I'm almost certain I would find. And then the other thing I was looking for was arrowheads. And I, I've had this long and intriguing thing with the search for arrowheads. I, I used to find them a lot when I was younger. And if you can find a certain lookout point that, that gives you an entire valley And you can get up on that lookout point. You can often find arrowheads up there because that's where kind of the work duty was. Mm -hmm. You're on lookout and you're up there bored to death. So you're making arrowheads if you're a a young 
Indian boy. Those are my three things. I just and they mm. they felt like very like father. This is easy. You can you can. I'm not asking for a new car. Mm-hmm. You know, I I just want to find these things. Yes. And fishing trip was lousy. Never found an elk antler. Never found an arrowhead. But I found the Arrowhead Hill. Here's the thing. I found this unbelievable hill up in Montana, and it was perfect for it. And I knew that its location was partly on private property. No one ever goes here. And I'm on that hill, and I don't find anything. And this was the third of this, you know, kind of disappointment, Mm. disappointment, disappointment. And I'm like, Jesus, what is this about? And Jesus says to me, am I enough? Am I enough? Oh, my gosh. It just brought me back. Like, I realized that it's Jesus and. Jesus and this working out. Jesus and that working out. Jesus and me getting this promotion. Jesus and me finding the right person to marry. Jesus and, you know. It's always Jesus and, and, I, and he was addressing that in me. And he was saying, you know, it's, it's not always about the blessings, John. Am I enough? Mm. Oh, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. It felt like a return to the sacred romance days way back and, and just turning my heart towards God and going, you are actually enough. You are enough. And no, I don't need a great fishing trip. And no, I don't need to find an arrowhead. And, and I don't need to be disappointed about those things and pout. I was kind of pout. Yeah. I, I, no, you're enough. And, and so because of this podcast, I'm now saying, oh my goodness, now you, you took me into that God, but you took me into it for a reason that is probably still ahead of me. Yes. I want to hang on to that lesson. My goodness. It's a, fundamental, central thing, but also the thought of, friends, you don't know what's coming, but God does. And so the things that he was showing you a year ago, six months ago, a month ago, that feel like ancient history now, I think this is how we push back against the next thing, the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. You know, our world, that's, it's just always what's next, what's now, what's now, what's now, what's next. And, and instead to begin to make some conscious decisions to say, yeah, but God doesn't work like that. And he has been speaking. And I want to go back and pick up with what he was speaking rather than trying to go to the smorgasbord and get the next thing. Mm-hmm. Oh, look, they have cherry pie today. You know, just that what have you done for me lately thing that I just hate. I hate that when I see that in my soul. Mm-hmm. I think this is I think this is the antidote to all that is to reach back. As you're saying that, what I think of John is to be aware of how I handled what God said or did back then is really informative. So the thing is gold. I mean, what you just described, oh my goodness, of is God enough? I mean, that that's that's a treasure. But what did I do with that thing God did two years ago? And how does that inform me? And and I think of an example of that, and this will just be a posture of confession. God has said some extraordinary things about what he thinks of me. Mm. It's somewhere at some point (laughs) yesteryear. (laughs) And I have all but forgotten those on most given days. But they weren't just um, Hallmark greeting cards. They were meant to be a fuel of belief and faith and confidence that gives you the strength to stand up against circumstances Mm. that seem to say something else. So I shared with you the story of taking Abigail to Hunter Education. And there was just this experience of, I didn't know if this is what we should be doing. When we were midstream, you know, I, I got the dates wrong. And so we ended up having to cram quite a bit of the study. It was a pace I didn't want to take my 11-year-old at. And I wasn't sure if she would enjoy it. And I, I, w- I w- just didn't have a lot of emotion in it. And normally I'm a pretty emotive person. And after the class after multiple days of homeschool and then a full course. And then she's back home and I'd been with her the whole time. I felt like God just 
encouraged me to take a short walk. Like you said, with transitions, I've just learned it's not a big exercise thing. It's just a 10 minute walk and the little piece of, of, of what I'll call a wild spot, a wild space near my neighborhood, which is nothing more than just some untamed land with a little hiking trail that people take their dog through. I was on the trail and I was pretty confounded with God, what are you doing here? And I'm not hearing clearly. And um, I'm pretty foggy. And, and I just had this little urging of him to ask me what he thinks of me. And John, I'm confessing it has been so long since I simply asked that question. Mm. Remind me mm. what you already said about what you think of me. Mm. And it was like just at turning and asking that question, it opened the floodgates. Mm. And it was like, oh, that's what, that's what this is. And really, that's what you see. And really, that's what this is about. So fast forward, I was in a call with a, uh, an ally yesterday, and, and he was in a in a really messy situation. And I just, and and there's, there's no clean, easy way out of this debacle. But what I felt like the spirit was urging me to ask him is like, when, when's the last time you just paused it all and turned your heart to the father and asked him what he sees when he looks at you. Mm. And he was like completely disoriented. And the idea was I only could ask that with integrity out of the fruit of what God just did in yes. my life and the yes. exposure that I had not stayed in that lesson, yes. but I need that fuel. And so as you're sharing, I'm aware that there are some places that I'm growing, but there are other pieces where I don't need the next thing. I need the last thing. Yes. And I need to to find ways to stay in that because God wants to build on it. There you go, gang. That's what we were trying to say. Maybe you don't need the next thing. Maybe what you need is the last thing. What was the last thing God said to you? Go back and get it. Linger with it. Stay with it. Let him build on that into this spring. You've been listening to the Ransom Heart Podcast, part two in a two-part conversation about hanging on to precious lessons. John Eldridge and Morgan Snyder, so glad to be with you this week.